The Situation Room has only gotten more important with every passing year, and it's it's contributed to the centralization of power inside the White House and probably the expansion of the power of the presidency over the last 60 years. I'm going to read you a quote from Jack Kennedy. Mm -hmm. I want you to respond to it. And then I want to talk a little bit about the current state of affairs in the Situation Room. Uh, this is a direct quote from Jack Kennedy. Uh, and he says, and I quote, these brass hats have one great advantage in their favor, he said. If we, if we do what they want us to do, none of us will be alive later to tell them that they were wrong. And he was specifically talking about Curtis LeMay. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember Curtis LeMay? Of course, but Curtis Yeah, so tell, tell us, Jack Kennedy had a distrust of the American military. He certainly and, uh, the reasons he set up the situation room, he, he, he felt that they were often putting him in a corner and Bobby Kennedy reinforced uh, that view. He didn't want to be pushed into that corner at all. You know, it's interesting you say uh, align it to, to current events. Interestingly, uh, the role that Joe Biden, President Biden played in the Obama White House was to push back on President Obama's behalf against those brass hats, against the generals who he felt were pushing for a longer commitment uh, and, a, and, a, and a higher commitment to the war in Afghanistan than was wise. And he would often run point for the president in pushing back against the generals. But the whole idea of the Situation Room was to give the president independent control over the various in information and intelligence streams coming into the entire government. So he wouldn't be beholden to his cabinet secretaries, to the military. And, you know, in, in that sense, and you, you made the point, the, the Situation Room has only gotten more important with every passing uh, year. And it's, it's contributed to the centralization of, uh, centralization of power inside the White House and probably the expansion of the power of the presidency over the last 60 years. Okay, well, the book the book is fantastic. It goes into a lot of stories. I want to get delve into them with you. But before I delve into them with you, tell us firsthand experience, Clinton administration, something obviously long ago, hopefully declassified. Uh, tell us a situation room story from your time in the White House. Uh, I'll tell you one funny one, one serious. The most serious one was, of course, was actually after Oklahoma City. Uh, you know, when the when the, the courthouse was bombed in Oklahoma City and we were at that point concerned in the immediate hours after the uh, the bombing that, you know, perhaps this was part of a series of bombings that might be taking place across the country. So that was one of the most high tension moments uh, that I experienced in the Situation Room. And in fact, I was finally able to find a picture. It's hard to get pictures from inside the Situation Room. I was finally able to find a picture from that day uh, that we were able to put on the back cover uh, of the book, uh, showing, uh, showing, yeah, me no, I have the picture right here, George. Uh, and you, a, and a see, there you are in there on that day. Yeah, um, you're, you're, uh, you, yeah. Sandy Berger as well. My hair was a little bit longer at that point. <laughs> um, Hey, look, you know what, man, at our age, okay. The fact that we're keeping our hair is a great blessing. Okay. It's a mitzvah Stephanopoulos. It's a mitzvah from God. Exactly right. Both of us are still, cause you know, we got a lot of bald friends, you and me, Stephanopoulos, a lot of bald friends. We, we so, sure do. but let me just give the, the lighthearted story as well. Yeah. This was actually right in the Please. end of the situation room, which was um, right next to the white house mess. And that is where I met Robin Williams who had just come back from looking at the situation room. I was down there getting a cup of coffee. And it was so interesting because, you know, he's a comic genius, but, you know, we all have our insecurities. He was incredibly socially anxious. So instead of having a conversation, he just did bits there for three minutes right there at the White House mess on the on the on the threshold of the Situation Room. And it was it was it just always stuck in my mind uh, watching this genius uh, so uncomfortable that really all he could ever do was perform. Well, listen, a, uh, an amazing guy. And that's a great biography, by the way, on him uh, shortly yeah. after his death. It was published. But just for our viewers and listeners that are young, uh, what George is referring to the White House mess, also located in the basement of the West Wing of the White House, is staffed by the U.S. Navy. And so they have uh, chefs in there. Uh, and you can go in there if you work for the president. You have an account. It's usually tied to your personal credit card. And you go in there, you can have a meal, you get a takeout, you can get a hamburger, uh, or you can sit down in the mess and have lunch. 
And uh, although I was in the White House for a short period of time, I did that almost every day because it gave me the opportunity to see other staff members down there. Out, right? And I was able and I was able to have some conversations and push along some projects that we were working on. Um, I want to go to President Nixon for a second. Uh, like Jack Kennedy, I uh, wasn't a lover of the Situation Room. He hardly, according to the book, he hardly set foot in the right there, yeah. Situation yeah. Room. Um, and uh, uh, Henry Kissinger said that Nixon was convinced that President Johnson had suffered from Situation Room Syndrome. Tell us what that is yeah, and tell us whether or not you agree I mean, with Dr. Kissinger. Johnson probably Kissinger. used the Situation Room more than any other president. He was there all the time. He moved his seat from the Oval Office, his favorite chair from the Oval Office down there. He even had Lady Bird serve breakfast to the staff every every once in a while. And he was calling them all hours of the day, night, almost entire, almost always about Vietnam. Um, but, you know, one of the things you saw there is that Johnson, who was a master of domestic politics and his, you know, a, a vacuum cleaner for information. He had 70 phones at his ranch in, 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 in Texas. He had t TVs and phones in every room of the White House. He always wanted to be in contact and he wanted every piece of information coming out of Vietnam. But, you know, one of the things that I learned from researching that experience is that, you know, information isn't always insight. <laughs> The the information that he was getting couldn't tell him how to win the war because it was a war that was unwinnable. And he had sensed that. But he, he just felt trapped by it all. Nixon was determined and Kissinger were determined not to get caught in that same trap. And what, what Kissinger meant by the Situation Room Syndrome was this idea that you could control the world from that windowless room in the yeah. White House, which yeah. you can't, but you all, but you can do an awful lot, <laughs> of, yeah. make a lot of consequential decisions in there. There was a different reason, though, an additional reason why Nixon did not go to the Situation Room. He didn't trust the Situation Room. He didn't trust the foreign policy professionals. Remember, he and Kissinger famously tapped the phones of many of their national security staff. And in that way, I think he shared something with the, the president you served for a short period of time, Donald Trump. Donald Trump didn't trust the Situation Room either. He considered it the home of the deep state. He hardly ever used it as well. Well, I mean, you bring it's a, it's a funny story about Kissinger and Donald Trump. And so now Trump has won the election. Uh, it's December of 2016. And I had the uh, opportunity to escort Dr. Kissinger oh, into okay. President-elect Trump's office, 26th floor Trump Tower. And Dr. Kissinger, he must have spent 15 minutes with Trump, which is a long time for Donald Trump, at least, particularly at that time. One sentence. And, 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 and watch me, George. Ready? And, and so Trump looks over at me. He's like, what is he saying? And I said, well, I got to get a little closer. to him." So his accent was such that Donald Trump stopped listening after like three minutes. But. What he was saying, and I want you to react to it, okay, what Dr. Kissinger was saying is that uh, we needed to pay more attention to Russia, uh, and we needed to be more wary of Russia, uh, but to, retreat, to, to treat them like a respectful adversary. He said that the, uh, the wound that uh, Obama inflicted, calling Putin a regional power, which was blasted all over the press, had hurt President Putin standing in Russia, and he was seeking retribution for that. Anyway, it was a it was a uh, memorable moment for me because I I hadn't spent much time in my life with Dr. Kissinger. That was probably the second or third time I had met him. But he moved the White House, and you write about it in the book. Dr. Kissinger, uh, in the Situation Room, moved the military oh. alert level to DEFCON three. Incredible. Tell in America. Tell, tell us a little bit about this, that. Tell us why. This is October 73. It's the Yom Kippur War, the first Yom Kippur War in Israel. Israel has been attacked. And uh, it's the height of the Cold War as well. It's also the height of Watergate. In, in, in that, that same month, Vice President Agnew had resigned under indictment. Uh, the, the, the tapes had been released. The articles of, of impeachment had been drawn up. Nixon is under siege and he is basically holed up in his private office in the old executive office building, uh, drinking, drinking scotch uh, late into the night and, uh, you know, listening to, to, to Broadway tunes on, on, on his on his record player while this crisis is playing out 
across the Middle East, a crisis which threatens to go nuclear. And the concern of Henry Kissinger at the time is that Russia was going to get involved on behalf of the Egyptians, Egyptians and Israel's other adversaries. And so on, on his own, uh, without the involvement of the president at all, there's no evidence at all the president was involved uh, in, in the decision making that night. Henry Kissinger raised the alert level of our nuclear forces at DEFCON 3, which has only been done once, which had only been done one, once before during the Cuban, uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Extraordinary that uh, a national security advisor would do that on his own. What I love about it, we learn about this from a, from a memo that was written by someone in the room, one of his military aides, Admiral Moore, Moore, who called it a, a piss swisher of a meeting. I had never heard that <laughs> word before. You're right about you. I saw that. And, and then one of the other things I, I learned as, as, as I was researching this book, not only did Henry Kissinger make this move, which by the way, did work by putting the forces on, on DEFCON 3, it did sort of back the Russians off a little bit. But what I yeah. also learned, and it came out many years later uh, from the Russian, the Soviet archives, is that not only was, was Nixon incapacitated at that time, drunk, depressed, concerned he was losing his presence. He was losing his presidency. Brezhnev was kind of in the same state. Brezhnev was in his Dacha outside of Moscow on sleeping pills and vodka. And it was, you know, the, the, the superpowers were kind of acting on automatic pilot with, yeah. the, with the staffers at the helm while both presidents were incapacitated. It, you know, it's a it's a I mean, I, it, when I read it, I was alarmed by it. But then I was also weirdly comforted by it yeah, what you're saying. Uh, b- because, you know, you the the world's moving and it's not. And what did Charles de Gaulle say? There's a graveyard filled with men. Once thought, right. <laughs> Once thought they were indispensable. So.